Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. Joining me is Chaz Freeman. He is a retired veteran U.S. diplomat who has served in a number of senior positions, including as the Assistant Secretary of Defense and U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Chaz Freeman, thank you for joining me. Pleasure to be with you. What is your assessment of the Russian invasion so far and how the Biden administration has responded to it? Ah, a huge question. Um, the, uh, uh, I thought in the run up to this that uh, uh, Mr. Putin was following a classic uh, form of coercive diplomacy, uh, massing troops on Ukraine's border, uh, issuing uh, very clear offers to negotiate, um, threatening indirectly to escalate beyond the border, not in Ukraine, uh, which the Russians repeatedly said they did not intend to invade, uh, but uh, perhaps uh, through putting pressure on the United States, similar to the one, the pressure that the Russians feel from us, namely missiles within uh, no warning distance at all of the capital. Uh, of course, Washington doesn't have quite the significance in our case that Moscow does for the Russians, but still. Um, I, I thought that was uh, what was in store. Uh, I was stunned when Putin actually invaded Ukraine. Um, I don't think his troops were prepared for it. There's no evidence that they had the logistics in place or that the troops were briefed about where they were going and why. And um, uh, so it looks like an impetuous decision. And if so, uh, it ranks with the decision of Tsar Nicholas II, the last Tsar, uh, to uh, go to war with Japan in 1904. Uh, that had disastrous consequences for political order in Russia. Uh, and um, I think this is a comparable blunder. Um, there are lots of uh, things being said about the course of the war, which is now about a month old. Um, and many of them are, I think, frankly, tendentious nonsense. Um, for example, um, it is, uh, it's alleged that the Russians are deliberately uh, targeting civilians. Uh, but I think in most wars, the ratio of military to civilian deaths is roughly one to one. And in this case, the reported civilian deaths are about one tenth of that which strongly suggests that the Russians have been holding back. Uh, we may now see um, the end of that with the ultimatum that has been issued in connection with Mariupol, uh, where, um, uh, if I understood correctly what the Russians are saying, uh, uh, they were saying surrender uh, or face the consequences, and the consequences would be a terrible leveling of the city. Um, we don't know uh, where this war is going to end, um, whether there will be a Ukraine or how much of a Ukraine there will be, um, what the effects inside Russia will be. Uh, there's clearly a lot of dissent in Russia, although I'm sure it's being exaggerated by our media. Um, the war is a fog of lies on all sides. Uh, it is virtually impossible to tell what is actually happening because every side is staging uh, the show. Um, uh, the champion of that uh, is Mr. Zelensky, who is brilliant at, as a communicator, it turns out. He's a, an actor who has found his uh, role and uh, probably helps Ukraine a great deal to have a president who is a, an accomplished actor who came equipped with his own studio staff, um, who is um, using that brilliantly. And I would say Mr. Zelensky uh, was elected to head a state called Ukraine, and he has created a nation called Ukraine. Um, he is, he is uh, somebody who, whose uh, perceived heroism has rallied Ukrainians to a degree that no one ever expected. 
Uh, so, um, but we don't know where this is going. And more to the point, um, the United States is not part of any effort to negotiate an end to the fighting um, to the extent that there is mediation going on. It seems to be by Turkey, uh, possibly Israel, uh, maybe China. Um, and that's about it. Um, and uh, the United States is not in the room. Uh, everything we are doing, uh, rather than accelerating an end to the fighting and some compromise seems to be aimed at prolonging the fighting, um, assisting the Ukrainian resistance, um, which is a noble cause, I suppose, but it will result in a lot of dead Ukrainians as well as dead Russians. Uh, and uh, also, um, the um, sanctions have no goals attached to them. There's no, there are no conditions which we've stated which would result in their uh, end. And finally, we have people now calling, including the President of the United States and uh, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, calling Putin a war criminal and uh, professing that they will intend to bring it to trial somehow. Now, uh, this gives Mr. Putin absolutely no incentive to compromise or reach an accommodation with the Ukrainians, and it probably guarantees a long war. Uh, and there seem to be a lot of people in the United States who think that's just dandy. It's good for the military industrial complex. It's, uh, it reaffirms our negative views of Russia. Uh, it reinvigorates NATO. It puts China on the spot. You know, what's so terrible about a long war? Uh, you know, if you're not Ukrainian, you probably, uh, you know, see some merit in a long war. Uh, so um, this has not gone as anybody predicted. Um, not Mr. Putin, not the intelligence community in the United States, which extrapolated war plans from uh, the disposition of forces on the Ukrainian border. Um, not the way um, the Germans, who are now rearming, anticipated. Uh, it's got a lot of shock value to it, and it's changing the world in ways we still don't understand. I wonder if U.S. intelligence extrapolated that Russia would invade based on the certainty that the U.S. would reject Russia's core security demands, uh, namely neutrality for Ukraine and Ukraine not joining NATO. And I'm wondering if their assurance that Biden would reject those demands made them, if that's what made them all the more confident that Russia would then invade. And on that point about NATO, I wanted to get your response to some comments that Zelensky recently made. He was speaking to Fareed Zakaria of CNN, and he made what I thought was a really telling admission about what he was told to say publicly about NATO before the war. I requested them personally to, to say directly that we are going to accept you into NATO or NATO in a year or two or five. Just say it directly and clearly or just say no. And the response was very clear. You are not going to be a NATO or EU member, but publicly the doors will remain open. But if you are not ready to preserve the lives of our people, uh, if you just want to see us straddle two world, worlds, if you want to see us in this dubious position where uh, we do not understand whether you can accept us or not, you cannot uh, place us in this situation. You cannot uh, force us to be in this limbo. So that's Zelensky saying that he was told by NATO, NATO members, presumably the U.S., that we're not going to let you in, but publicly we're going to leave the door open. I'm wondering, Ambassador Freeman, your response to that. Well, that, those are two questions. First, um, uh, in my experience, the intelligence community does not start from estimates of U.S. policy. Uh, and I think what we saw was um, an order of battle analysis with the judgment as expressed at one point by Secretary of State Lincoln that, you know, if we massed 150,000 troops on somebody's border, that would mean we were about to invade. Uh, in other words, mirror imaging. 
you know, that's what we would do. Therefore, that's what the Russians will do. Um, I think Mr. Putin was surprised by uh, being stiff-armed uh, on the, after all, 28-year-old demand that NATO stop enlarging in the direction of uh, Russia. At root, this is a contest over whether Ukraine will be in the U.S. sphere of influence, the Russian sphere of influence, or neither's. And neutrality, which is what Mr. Putin had started out saying he wanted, uh, was compatible with um, neither side having Ukraine uh, within its uh, sphere. Um, whether that's now possible or not, I don't know. Um, I think one of the mistakes Mr. Putin made in upping the ante was to make it very difficult for Ukraine to become neutral. Um, but um, uh, on the question of what Mr. Zelensky was told, um, I think this is remarkably cynical, uh, or perhaps it was naive and unrealistic on the part of uh, leaders in the West. Uh, Zelensky is obviously a very intelligent man and he saw what the consequences of being put in what he called limbo would be. Namely, um, Ukraine would be hung out to dry. And the West was basically saying, we will fight to the last Ukrainian for Ukrainian independence, which essentially remains our stand. Um, it's pretty cynical, uh, despite all the patriotic fervor. Uh, and I, I'd add, you know, I have heard, um, uh, I know people who have been attempted to be objective about this, uh, and, and they're immediately accused of being Russian agents, or uh, that is to say, the price of speaking on this subject is to join the pom-pom girls in a frenzy of support for our position. Uh, and uh, if you're not part of the chorus, you're not allowed to say anything. And not you can't sing. So I think that this has had very injurious effects uh, on Western liberties, and um, it has enforced an almost—I um, uh, won't say it's totalitarian, but it's certainly a similar uh, kind of control on freedom of expression. Uh, and inquiry uh, in in the West. Uh, it, it's very depressing, really. Um, we should rise to this occasion. We should be concerned about achieving a balance in Europe that sustains peace. That requires incorporating Russia into a governing council for Europe of some sort. In Europe, historically, as been at peace only when all the great powers who could overthrow the peace have been co-opted into it. A perfect example is the Congress of Vienna, which followed the Napoleonic Wars, where Kissinger's great hero Metternich and others had the good sense to, to reincorporate France uh, into the governing councils of Europe. And that gave Europe a hundred years of peace. Of course, there were a few minor conflicts, but nothing major. And after World War I, when the victors, the United States and uh, Britain and France, insisted on excluding Germany from a role in the affairs of Europe, as well as this newly formed Soviet Union, the result was World War II and the Cold War. So instead of, uh, it's really depressing that instead of trying to figure out how to give Russia reasons not to invade countries and to uh, violate international laws it has. Um, doesn't make, that does not make Russia unique, of course, but instead of, of trying to give Russia reasons for being well-behaved, we have, in its view, left it with no alternative but the use of force.
you take us back to the 1990s. Uh, you served in the Clinton administration at a time when there was a you know big discussion, big debate in Washington over the future of uh, European security architecture. This is after the Soviet Union had collapsed. It had never Russia was never weaker. There were people, including inside the George H.W. Bush administration, who talked about pledging support for neutrality, not trying to bring the former Soviet states into one camp or the other. And Clinton ultimately, Bill Clinton, President Clinton, went with NATO expansion, went with violating the pledges that accompanied the end of the Soviet Union to expand NATO to Russia's borders. Can you take us back to that time and the debates that were taking place and how that's fueled the crisis we're in today? Well, I actually had a good deal to do with the formulation of what became known as the Partnership for Peace. Um, and this was two things. It was uh, a pathway to responsible application for NATO membership, but it and it was also a cooperative security system rather than a collective security system for Europe. Um, it left the members to decide whether they defined themselves as European or not. Uh, so Tajikistan joined the Partnership for Peace, but it made no effort to civilianize its defense establishment or subject its military to parliamentary oversight. And it didn't learn the 3000 standardization agreements that are the operating doctrine of NATO that allow a Portuguese soldier to die for Poland or vice versa. Uh, so um, that process uh, was the, the, the question of what countries would have what relationship with NATO was left to those countries. Uh, what happened in 1994, and which was a midterm election year, and 1996, which was a presidential election year, was interesting. Uh, in 1994, Mr. Clinton was talking out of both sides of his mouth. Uh, he was telling the Russians uh, that we were in no rush to add members to NATO and that our preferred path was the partnership for peace. Same time he was hinting to uh, the ethnic diasporas of Russophobic countries in Eastern Europe. And by the way, it's easy to understand their Russophobia uh, given their history, uh, that no, no, we were going to get these countries into NATO as fast as possible. And in 1996, he made that pledge explicit. Um, 1994, he got a, an outburst from um, Yeltsin, who was then the president of the Russian Federation. 1996, he got another one. Uh, and as time went on, when Mr. Putin came in, uh, he regularly protested uh, the enlargement of NATO in ways that disregarded uh, Russia's self-defense interests. Uh, so there's no, there was no, there should have been no surprise about this. Uh, 28, for 28 years, Russia has been warning that at some point it would snap, uh, and it has. And it has done it in a very destructive way, both in terms of its own interests and in terms of the broader prospects for peace in Europe. You know, there really is no excuse uh, for what Mr. Putin has done. Um, to understand it is not to condone it. Uh, so uh, I think um, uh, the, the, what happened here was a, con a combination of forces. There were those people in the United States who were triumphalist about the end of the Cold War. There were those who felt that um, what they perceived as victory, I think it was a default by the Russians, but anyway, the game was over. This allowed the United States to incorporate all the countries right up to Russia's borders and beyond them, beyond those borders in the Baltics, into an American sphere of influence. Uh, and essentially, they posited a global sphere of influence for the United States modeled on the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, and that's pretty much what we have. Ukraine entered that sphere of influence. It was not neutral after 2014. That was the purpose of the coup, was to prevent neutrality 
or a pro-Russian government in Kiev uh, and to replace it with a pro-American government that would bring Ukraine into our sphere. Uh, since about 2015, uh, this is, of course, Russia reacted by annexing Crimea. Um, since 2015, we have, um, uh, 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 let me say about Crimea, of course, Russia reacted because its major na naval base in, on the Black Sea is in Crimea. And the prospect that Ukraine was going to be incorporated into NATO and an American sphere of influence would have, would have uh, uh, negated the value of that base. So uh, I don't think it had anything to do with the wishes of the people of Crimea, who, however, were quite happy to be part of Russia rather than Ukraine. Uh, so uh, since about 2015, the United States has been arming, training uh, Ukrainians against Russia. Uh, major step up in, in 2017 um, in that. Um, <laughs> ironically, because um, of Mr. Trump, you know, who was actually impeached for uh, trying to leverage arms sales to Ukraine for political dirt on the Bidens. Uh, but at any rate, um, uh, it isn't as though Ukraine was not treated uh, as a, an extension of NATO, it was. And this had a good deal to do with the Russian decision to invade, I'm sure. Um, it's not, um, uh, at the moment, I understand the Ukrainian forces, although they've lost their command and control, uh, there are major units that are surrounded and in danger of being annihilated by the Russians. Um, there are cities that are in danger of being pulverized. None of this has happened yet, but the Ukrainians do not lack weaponry. Uh, they have more than enough to deal with the Russian forces uh, on a dispersed basis, and, and they have shown themselves to be very courageous in defending their country with those weapons. A lot of them are dying for their country. Um, one can admire that, and but one must also lament it. Let me quote you, uh, Elliot Cohen served as a counselor to Condoleezza Rice when she was the Secretary of State. And he writes this in the Atlantic magazine. He says, the United States and its NATO allies are engaged in a proxy war with Russia. They are supplying thousands of munitions and hopefully doing much else, sharing intelligence, for example, with the intent of killing Russian soldiers. And because fighting is, as the military theorist Karl von Clausewitz said, a trial of moral and physical forces through the medium of the latter, we must face a fact. To break the will of Russia and free Ukraine from conquest and subjugation, many Russian soldiers have to flee, surrender, or die, and the more and faster, the better. That's Elliot Cohen, former State Department advisor in the Atlantic. I'm, I'm wondering your response to that, especially him calling, just openly declaring that the U.S. is using Ukraine for what he calls a proxy war against Russia. Well, Professor Cohen is a very honest man, uh, which is to his credit. Um, and therefore, his uh, adherence to neoconservative objectives is entirely transparent. Um, and what he just said, what you quoted him as saying, is consistent with the neoconservative objective of regime change in Russia. And it's also consistent with fighting to the last Ukrainian to achieve it. Uh, I, I find it deplorable. Um, but I have to say, it's probably representative of a very large body of opinion in Washington. And why? Why does this view of Ukraine as essentially cannon fighter against Russia. Why is it so prevalent in Washington? This is essentially cost free for the United States. As long as we don't cross some Russian red line that leads to escalation against us, we are engaged as Mr. Cohen's, Professor Cohen said, in a proxy war. And we're selling a lot of weapons. Uh, that makes arms manufacturers happy. We're supporting a valiant resistance, which makes gives politicians something to grow about. We're going against a, an officially designated enemy, 
Russia, uh, which makes us feel vindicated. Uh, so from the point of view of those uh, of the, those with these self-interested views of the issue, this is a freebie. And as someone with extensive experience in China, you served as President Nixon's translator, interpreter, when he did his historic visit to China. I'm wondering what you make of China's response to Russia's invasion so far and these warnings that they've been receiving in recent days from the Biden administration, trying to basically tell them not to help out Russia or else there will be consequences. Well, this has been fascinating to watch. Um, the Chinese clearly agree with Mr. Putin and Russian nationalists in objecting to NATO enlargement. Um, having been subjected to foreign spheres of influence in the 19th and 20th century, they don't like them. Um, they don't believe Ukraine should be part of either the Russian or the US sphere of influence. They are the last citadel of Westphalianism in the world. Um, they really do believe strongly in sovereignty and territorial integrity. Mr. Putin went to Beijing for the Winter Olympics and had a long discussion with Xi Jinping, the Chinese president. Uh, and they agreed um, that uh, NATO should not enlarge, uh, there should not be spheres of influence, and that the security architecture in Europe needed to be adjusted uh, to put uh, to relieve Russia of the sense of menace that it experiences. Uh, I don't believe for a minute that Mr. Sh Mr. Putin told Mr. Xi that he planned to invade it, invade Ukraine. Um, in fact, he may have said he had no intention of doing it. I don't know. Uh, he may indeed have had no intention of doing it at that point, assuming that his coercive diplomacy was going to get a response. Uh, but of course, it got no response. Uh, it got an evasive set of um, counter proposals about arms control, which didn't address the main question he was raising which was how Russia could feel secure when a hostile alliance was advancing to its very borders. Um, anyway, poor Mr. Xi Jinping now has to straddle something he probably almost certainly had no idea was in prospect. On the one hand, he can oppose spheres of influence and demand consideration for the security concerns of great powers, as he does with regard to Russia and with regard to his own country. But on the other hand, Ukraine is being violated. Um, so the Chinese have had an awkward straddle. The irony is, I don't think this was intended, but inadvertently this has put them in a position where they're one of the few countries that might conceivably mediate an end to the fighting. And I noticed that recently the Chinese have played, have emphasized heavily the need for there to be negotiations to bring that fighting to an end at the earliest possible moment. Um, that doesn't mean that they're going to end up mediating. Uh, mediation is a very difficult thing, and often mediators uh, enter uh, the mediation with two friends and end up with two enemies. Uh, so this is not something you take on uh, lightly. Um, at this point, however, I would just say nobody knows what's going on between, or at least uh, nobody, who, if anybody does know, they're not saying what's going on between Russians and Ukrainians in the meetings that they are having. The Turks claim that the two sides are close to an agreement. Various points, Lavrov and, and Kobela, they the Ukrainian foreign minister have both um, said something similar, uh, but there is no agreement. Uh, and it's not clear at this point uh, whether there can be an agreement. Uh, by taking the land corridor from Donetsk to Crimea, 
Mr. Putin has taken something that he probably will be very unwilling to give up. Um, and as I said, you ask Ukrainians to accept neutrality when they've been battered around, battered around the way they have been and lost all their lives and property that they have. It's not, uh, not at all easy for them. So even though from the very beginning, the solution has been obvious, which is some variant of the Austrian state treaty of 1955, meaning a guaranteed uh, independence in return for two things. One, decent treatment of minorities inside the uh, guaranteed state, and second, neutrality for the guaranteed state. Um, this has been there on, uh, on the, should have, this is still the objective as far as we can tell, uh, but it's been made more difficult rather than less uh, by the outbreak of war. What's your sense of the agency and the free reign that Zelensky actually has to make decisions and the extent of U.S. influence over him? One of the things that Professor Stephen F. Cohen warned about, the late Professor Stephen F. Cohen warned about, to me in 2019, was that unless the U.S. steps up and support Zelensky with, in his mandate of making peace with the rebels in the East, then he has no chance because otherwise he'll have to submit to the far right inside Ukraine who are very influential. And since then, I've seen no indication there has been any sort of support from Washington uh, for making peace with Russia. Trump, of course, was impeached when he paused those weapon sales. There's that famous incident where Lindsey Graham and John McCain and Amy Klobuchar go to the front lines in late 2016 of the uh, Ukrainian military's fight against the rebels in the Donbass and Lindsey Graham says this is 2017 is going to be the year of offense and Russia has to pay a heavier price. Your fight is our fight. 2017 will be the year of offense. All of us will go back to Washington and we will push the case against Russia. Enough of a Russian aggression. It is time for them to pay a heavier price. I believe you will win. I am convinced you will win and we will do everything we can to provide you with what you need to win. Even fast forward to, uh, to when Biden came in, Time magazine reported that when Zelensky shut down the three leading opposition TV networks in Ukraine, that that was conceived as a welcome gift to the Biden administration to fit with the Biden administration's agenda. So what's your sense of all that? The agency that Zelensky actually has and the extent of U.S. influence over his decisions? Um, Zelensky was elected by a landslide, not because of anything except he wasn't all the other candidates. Um, so uh, his political capital very quickly evaporated, uh, and he really had no power to make decisions. Uh, whether there were other people behind him making decisions or that he mouthed, or whether he was taking instructions from uh, the Biden administration or the Trump administration or whoever uh, is unclear. But what, it, what is clear to me is that Mr. Zelensky's heroic performance as the leader of wartime Ukraine has gained him enormous political capital. He has the ability now to make a compromise. It will not be easy. As you indicated, there are elements in the coalition that supports him uh, who are very right-wing and anti-Russian, um, perhaps even neo-Nazi. And, uh, and by the way, um, Anti-Semitism is a disastrous aspect of Nazism, but it's not the definition of Nazism. And apparently, you can be a Nazi and have and have a Jewish president and not feel uncomfortable about it. Uh, so um, uh, I think this this simplistic argument that well, because Ukraine has a has a secular Jewish president who apparently doesn't really identify as Jewish but is identified as Jewish, this means somehow that 
there can't be any Nazis backing him. It's ridiculous. Um, anyway, there clearly Ukraine has been very divided in multiple directions ever since its independence. Um, and I'm sure those fissures continue to exist. Mr. Zelensky, however, has, you know, he really has empowered himself, I think, if he gets backing from the United States and others. And here we have a problem. Uh, not only do we have the Putin is a war criminal and must be brought to trial statements coming out of leaders in the West, including President Biden, but we also have people like Boris Johnson saying the sanctions have to stay on whatever Russia does because Russia has to be punished. Well, this means Russia has absolutely no incentive to accommodate. And it also means that Mr. Zelensky has no freedom to accommodate. Uh, so this is the opposite of an effort to resolve the issue. It's an effort, in effect, whatever its intent, uh, to perpetuate the fighting, and uh, and that is uh, that is going to be disastrous uh, for uh, the Ukrainians, for the Russians, and, and for Europe, and ultimately for the United States. You mentioned the, the neo-Nazi issue in Ukraine. Let me quote you from a new article in the Washington Post by Rita Katz. She's the executive director of the Site Intelligence Group. Her article is called Neo-Nazis are exploiting Russia's war in Ukraine for their own purposes. Not since ISIS have we seen such a flurry of recruitment activity. And she writes this. In many ways, the Ukraine situation reminds me of Syria in the early and middle years of the last decade. Just as the Syrian conflict served as the perfect breeding ground for, for groups like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, similar conditions may be brewing in Ukraine for the far right. I'm wondering your response to that. Well, I think she's got logic on her side. Um, I frankly don't know Ukraine personally well enough to know exactly what the definition of a member of the Azov Brigade or other neo-Nazi groups is. Um, I think uh, right-wing populism is ugly enough in our own country um, to imagine that it's even uglier in a country as divided as Ukraine. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't dismiss the whole thing at all because uh, Ukraine has a horrible history of running pogroms, uh, first against Jews and then, frankly, against Russians. Um, and so um, uh, to, um, uh, to dismiss the argument that there are people with violent tendencies and great prejudice, ethnic prejudices um, involved in this fight um, seems to me to be wrong. So I hadn't read the article you cited. Um, I don't know the, the author, but she makes sense to me. And I'm curious what you make now of the allegations we're getting from both the U.S. and Russia against the other, that the other side is plotting false flag chemical attacks. Mm. This has only surfaced in recent days. In the case of the U.S., it strikes me that they're recycling a playbook that they employed under the Obama administration, which was there were people inside the Obama White House who wanted to put out the option of military intervention. And the red, and the red line was a good way to pursue that. I'm wondering if you think the Biden administration, especially the remnants of the Obama administration, Blinken, Sullivan, are and Biden himself, are recycling that playbook? I certainly hope not, but it does have a resemblance to the probably false flag use of chemical weapons in Syria. Um, and um, and it, it almost worked in Syria. Uh, it was only at the last minute when uh, the chief of the Joint Chiefs um, said to the president, you know, this isn't a slam dunk. There are real questions here. Um, and the questions were about whether this was a Turkish or Turkish and Saudi or whoever um, false flag intended to uh, force an American escalation over Syria. It was only when that happened that uh, Mr. Obama decided that he should remember the Constitution, which he once thought, which he once taught about, 
which says that the, only the Congress can authorize a war. Uh, the president does not have the constitutional authority to do that. Um, of course, in practice, presidents since Truman have done so. Uh, but um, he put it to the Congress, and the Congress behaved in its usual craven fashion, fashion and ducked the issue. And he said it's unfair to ask us to do our constitutional duty. Uh, and uh, so we won't, uh, once again. Uh, and so, you know, that almost worked in Syria. Um, and this could well be a replay. From a military point of view, I can't see any reason that the Russians would want to use chemical weapons. Uh, usually they are a defensive device against a mass attack, but there's no such thing going on in Ukraine. Uh, they don't need chemical weapons. Um, they have enough frightful weapons of other types uh, without having to do that. Uh, so this does strike me as uh, on its surface, it's suspicious. With a former U.S. ambassador to Saudi Arabia, what do you make of their positioning so far? There's a lot of talk of them essentially moving closer with Russia. A lot was made that MBS refused to take Joe Biden's call when he phoned him recently. And Saudi Arabia considering accepting payments for oil in the Chinese currency and the implications of, of that. Your thoughts there when it comes to Saudi Arabia's uh, sh apparent shifting stance here? Saudi Arabia has been uh, very ill at ease with its U.S. relationship for a long time. Um, the affection that the Saudis once enjoyed in the United States uh, from a limited number of people, to be sure, has been replaced by mass Islamophobia. Saudi Arabia has been successfully vilified in U.S. politics. Saudi Arabia's assumption that the United States would um, uh, back the monarchy against the tax on it from at home or abroad um, was uh, thrown into uh, doubt when the United States rather gleefully saw Mubarak overthrown in Egypt. Um, the United States is now a competitor for oil production and exports, no longer a consumer. Uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi and its attribution to Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, um, obviously does not endear him to us or us to him. And so uh, Mr. Biden has refused to speak with him. Um, so at, at, at this point, um, the Saudis have gone full bore looking for alternative partners uh, to rely upon. Uh, and there is no single partner that they can rely upon, uh, but they have every interest in exploring alternative relationships, not just with Russia or China, but with India and others, and they are doing so. Uh, so. Um, the same thing with the United Arab Emirates. Uh, it, you know, bound to the United States in the so-called Abraham Accords. Um, it has a reputation well deserved for real politik. It too is crafting its own future, and it is not prepared to mortgage that future uh, to American policy, especially when the common view in the Gulf is that the United States is retreating. So um, this brings us all to back to the Chinese, the Indians, the Brazilians, others um, who have not uh, got onto the bandwagon uh, hurling uh, invective at Russia. Uh, I think the Chinese ambassador the other day was on the, one of the Sunday talk shows and to the extent they let him have, get a word in, um, he, uh, he said very clearly, and I agree with him, that you know, condemnation does not accomplish anything very much at all. And what is required is serious diplomacy. 
And what has been missing has been serious diplomacy. There have been uh, there have been condemnations, there have been sanctions, there have been arms shipments to the Ukrainians from a remarkable range of sources, by the way. I mean, it illustrates the extent of Mr. Putin's mis mistake that even Austria and Switzerland, two neutral countries, have provided aid to the Ukrainian resistance, uh, as has Finland. Um, so, um, uh, Mr. Putin has paid a huge price in terms of uh, arousing animus against his country. India and Brazil are in the same situation as as China? They're in the same straddle. They see no benefit in alienating a partner, namely Russia. Um, and uh, while they both may care about the independence of Ukraine, um, I think taking sides with the United States against Russia, which is what they're being asked to do, uh, is a step too far. Um, you know, uh, let's face it, this is at, in large measure, as I said at the outset, a struggle between the United States and Russia for a sphere of influence that will include Ukraine. It's US-Russia. It's not Russia versus Europe. Um, so uh, in this context, why would a great power that values its cooperation with Russia want to alienate Russia? We're going to wrap. So any final words for us? At the beginning of this interview, you said that the you know long-term geopolitical implications of this crisis are unknown. The world is changing in ways we don't know. But I'm wondering if there's any speculation that you are comfortable engaging in about what the geopolitical implications are. A lot of people are are speculating that this could mean the, the weakening of uh, U.S. dollar supremacy as a result of China and Russia drawing closer together. Any thoughts on that? And anything else you want well, to leave us with as we wrap? No, I think the reliance on uh, our sovereignty over the dollar to um, our abuse of that sovereignty, if you will, to impose sanctions that are illegal under the UN Charter, which are unilateral, um, ultimately risks the status of the dollar. And we may, in fact, be at a moment when the dollar is taken down a notch or two. Um, you know, it isn't the case. Uh, well, I, sh I should just say that the, the, the dollar serves two purposes. One is as a store of value. If you have dollars, you're fairly confident that they're going to have a significant value 10 years from now, as well as today. Um, so that is why countries keep reserves in dollars. Um, and it's why people stash dollars in mattresses all over the world. Um, the other use of the dollar is to settle trade transactions. Um, it's the most convenient currency in which to do that. And in many cases, when other currencies are used, they are used with reference to the dollar and the dollar exchange rates. Both these things are now in jeopardy. Um, the oil trade, commodities, being priced in dollars is the basis for the dollar's international value. If you look at the United States trade and balance, balance of payments, uh, you will see that we are in chronic deficit. That says the dollar is overvalued. And that means it's vulnerable uh, to devaluation. So um, if, you, uh, if you start saying, uh, you know, SWIFT, the, uh, the, the communications system in Belgium that handles most of the world's uh, transactions, uh, was established to ensure uh, that, that trade could be conducted unencumbered by politics. And now it's being encumbered by US imposed unilateral sanctions on a huge array of countries, uh, you know, Iran, Russia, China, uh, you name it, uh, even threatened against India. But so um, 
uh, if the use of the dollar is now encumbered, it's less desirable and people will want to make workarounds around it. Will the dollar hold its value? Uh, we have a Congress that repeatedly goes to the brink of defaulting on our national debt. Um, you know, this is not something that inspires confidence. And I'll add a final factor, which I think is very injurious potentially, and that is bankers get deposits because they are fiduciaries. Uh, they are meant to hold the deposits for the benefit of those who deposit the money and not to rip it off themselves. But we've just confiscated the entire national treasury of Afghanistan and we've confiscated half of Russian reserves. We've confiscated the Venezuelan reserves. We have our ally, the British, have confiscated Venezuela's gold uh, reserves. Um, the Anglo-American reputation as bankers, as fiduciaries, is in trouble. And uh, so the question is, um, uh, if you're a country that thinks, well, maybe you might have some serious policy difference with the United States someday, why would you put your money in dollars? Um, the answer has been there's no alternative. But there are now major efforts being made to create alternatives. So we, we, we're we not there yet, but this is, a, you know, and I don't want to make a prediction, but I think this is a major question that we need to monitor carefully. Because if the dollar loses its value, the American influence on a global level decreases enormously. Yes, Freeman, thank you as always for your time and insight. I say this on behalf of uh, many people in my audience who have come to rely on your expertise. It's really, really appreciated. So thank you. It was a pleasure to talk to you.